All right, well, tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the next part of Unit 3. Uh, unit 3, as you remember, is all about matter, properties, and changes. And today we're looking at uh, the periodic table, which we've been looking at a lot last unit with electron configurations and SPDF and all sorts of quantum number business. Uh, tonight we're going to tell you a little bit about how those quantum numbers and those electron configurations and valence electrons uh, are related to the properties of the elements <clears throat> and some of the different regions of the periodic table and what the properties are and how they're predictable for those regions of the table. So we'll find out that a lot of the connections between last unit and this unit as far as the periodic table and those different properties that we've talked about will finally become clear as we start looking at the periodic table and some of the, the, the uh, named sections of the periodic table itself. So what I'm going to give you, what I'm giving you in class to, uh, to fill out as you're going through this is a blank periodic table. You've been using a couple of these at different times throughout the year already and what I'll have you do is highlight certain parts of the periodic table on there maybe shade them in or uh, mark them in with a name at least or put a special symbol in each box or something like that so that you kind of have a little bit of a legend or a key for your periodic table. Um, you don't need to shade these two regions in in particular. I'm just going to show you the difference between two terms that get thrown around a lot in periodic table sort of geography if you will and those are groups and periods. <clears throat> groups are the vertical columns on the periodic table and so you see here that I've got a gold one um, highlighted and there are 18 on the periodic table from left to right across. We don't count separately the uh, <clears throat> groups down here in the F block from the rest. Those are part of, as you know, they're tucked in over here in the D block and so they're not a special uh, additional number of groups. And also that you see here blue I've got highlighted across uh, one of the periods. This is the fourth period down on the periodic table. So periods are the horizontal rows and there are seven of those and groups or we often call families are the vertical columns on the periodic table. Find out as we go that the word families is often more relevant or appropriate because on occasion um, we'll find that the properties are sort of like those of a family. If you have a family where everyone's blonde or everyone's got red hair or everyone's very tall or something like that, you can just tell they're part of a family because they have some common trait in, in common. And it's genetic of course in people but in the periodic table we'll find out that it's not genetics as much as it's valence electrons which are kind of like the genes of, of the elements. So the first thing I'll have you do on your blank periodic table is draw in this dark stair step line. You've seen this on periodic tables before. Your blank one does not have this, but you want to draw it in carefully in this position. So you start up here in the corner, at kind of the top left corner of the P block, and go down across, down across, and just kind of make this stair step line. What this does is separate us on the left, the metals, and on the right, the nonmetals. And so you see these two arrows pointing to the two different halves of the periodic table. And on the left will be metals, and on the right will be nonmetals in general. There are also some other elements that ride kind of right along this stair step line, and those have a special name. We'll get to those later. So, what I'll show you here again on your periodic table, you want to draw in this dark line, and you want to label perhaps to the left and the right the metals and the nonmetals. All right. Next thing to do is to kind of give you a general definition or differences, I guess, between metals and nonmetals. A couple of things important to mention. One, uh, metals as we just marked on our table are below and left of that stair step line. They're also generally shiny or the fancy word we use for shiny is lustrous and at room temperature they tend to be solids. The only exception of that is mercury. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature uh, and it's a metal. Very important properties that mercury being a liquid at room temperature lets it do. Uh, for example mercury being a liquid allows it to be a, a conductor that is part of old-fashioned, somewhat old-fashioned thermostats for example. And if you've never seen inside of an old thermostat, I'll, pre I'll probably show you one in class so you can kind of see what I mean. Uh, metals also tend to be, with that property in mind, good conductors of heat and electricity. Um, they also tend to be malleable or ductile. Malleable means it can be pounded into a flat sheet or more modernly we roll them into flat sheets and ductile means they can be stretched or pulled or drawn into a very thin wire. We can make wires of copper, for example, that are as thin as a human hair. Nonmetals are above and right of the stair step line, plus the element hydrogen. Important not to forget hydrogen. He's kind of over there in no man's land, but he's a nonmetal too. And nonmetals are, in terms of their properties, they're exactly the opposites of metals, basically. They tend not to be shiny. They're dull. They tend not to be very malleable or ductile. You can't pound them into thin sheets. Uh, you can only break them when you hit them with a hammer, for example, so they're very brittle. Um, at room temperature, many of them are gases, some are solids, and then there's one liquid there too, and that's bromine. We'll talk more about that as the year goes on. They are not good conductors. They, in fact, are bad conductors. 
the word we use for that then is insulators. And so poor conductors, or another term that you might want to write down, is insulators for nonmetals. And there are other properties of nonmetals too, but these are some just some really broad terms and broad properties. Um, we get more specifics later on as we go to the different groups. The first group of metals I'm going to have you specifically mark on your on your table are the alkali metals. And you here I've, I've got you so you can see they're shaded in sort of like pink. Um, it doesn't matter if you shade them in with a particular color. If you have colored pencils or uh, pens, if you have crayons or anything at all that you can kind of shade these in with, that'd be great. Um, if not, at least write down the, the box or maybe outline it with a darker pen and uh, enable, put the name alkali metals in the box. Uh, some people prefer to put a symbol in there, maybe a star or an X or something. You can do what you want. But you want to kind of make a little map of the periodic table here. Alkali metals consist of group 1, except for hydrogen. Hydrogen is not an alkali metal. And every one of the alkali metals ends in what's, what we would see as an S1 configuration. And we saw this with valence electrons last unit. So sodium uh, in this group uh, is the second pink box down right here and its configuration ends in 3s1. Potassium below it ends in 4s1 and below that rubidium 5s1 and so forth. Uh, these elements are very soft. They're very soft, very reactive. So soft in fact that we can often, if we were so inclined, they're not safe to hold necessarily, uh, but we could pick up a piece of certain alkali metals and squish it between your fingers like a hard clay or cut it with a, with a butter knife. And often when we're getting ready for lab, we will. We'll cut this with a butter knife. You could almost cut potassium with like a plastic fork. They're very reactive, uh, dangerously so, and you'll see that in the lab coming up uh, in about a week and a half. The alkaline earth metals, very similar name, uh, are a part of group 2, and it's all of group 2. You see I've got it here shaded in blue. Each of these ends in an S2 electron configuration. So for example, the very first one at the top is beryllium. Beryllium is 1s2, 2s2, and so it ends in 2s2. Uh, magnesium is below that, ends in 3s2. Calcium below that in 4s2, and so forth. And these are all also somewhat reactive, nowhere near as reactive as the alkali metals, but quite reactive. Now, you see between these two names, alkali metals, the first ones, the last ones here, and the current ones, alkaline earth metals, they both have a very similar sounding looking name, alkali and alkaline. Basically those two words both have to do with the pH, or the, the, the acid-base chemistry of these elements. If I put any of these elements into water, they will react with water to, f to make a solution that has a very high pH or is considered a base. And another term that we use in chemistry for being a base is being alkaline. And so you see that word here, the alkaline earth metals are those metals in this case that, again, if we put them into water, will produce an alkaline or basic solution. And the same thing is true for the alkali metals. These 12 or so elements um, would be considered the uh, elements that can make the strongest bases if we could get our hands on them. Some of them are so dangerous we really can't get our hands on them at all. The next group is the transition metals. The transition metals is by far the largest section of the periodic table. Now depending on which textbook you look at or which website you, look, you might look at, their, their definition of which elements fall in this group might be slightly different than what I'll ask you to mark down here. Um, some, el some, some periodic tables on, and books and on websites will say just the D block. Um, that leaves us out some other elements that are under the, under the staircase there that I think are important to just include with transition metals. They don't necessarily have different properties, and so I don't see why we necessarily need to separate them out by a different name. So we'll call the transition metals this huge section of orange looking elements here. And I'm going to move to the other uh, periodic table for just a moment and let you see those uh, a little bit bigger on the screen if it helps you to find them. So if you want to pause that and kind of shade those or mark those, you can do that. Um, they would be, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here, they would be these. And so you've got them kind of orange here on the screen. It's a lot of elements. It's uh, more than 40, close to maybe 50 even elements that we're shading in here. So it's the entire D block and a few of the P block elements. I would say just all of the P block metals, which would be the elements below and to the left of that staircase line. Now you see I've left out just a couple here. If you look at your periodic table, I've left out this element and this element. And so those two are not transition metals. We'll, get them, we'll give them their name later on. These, these metals tend to be very durable. They're found in many alloys. You've been hearing that term a lot in class. And uh, suffice to say that any metal object you might go and buy at Menards or, or Lowe's or something, Ace Hardware, you're going to find th these metal objects tend to be made of transition metals. Very few exceptions. There are a few uh, other metals that might pop in there and be commonly found in metal things. Uh, but most metal things, bolts, screws, sheet metal, all sorts of these sorts of things are going to be made of these transition metals. They're very durable. They're somewhat resistant to corrosion, especially when they're in alloys, and they're pretty tough. And most of them are very safe. 
uh, to handle and have around, and uh, they're very readily accessible, so they're fairly cheap. The last group of metals to mark are called the inner transition metals. Sometimes I hear these called the rare earth metals. It's a little bit of a misnomer, I think. Um, the, mis the, the, the misunderstanding about that is that they're not necessarily all that rare. Some of the uh, inner transition metals down here in the F block are very, very common, and we can find them all over the world. Uh, in fact, you can go to Radio Shack and buy a, a little stack of neodymium magnets for just a couple bucks, and they're a rare earth metal, if you call them that. Uh, that's not very rare. If you can buy them for a couple bucks, they can't be all that rare. And so I like the term inner transition metals better. It tells us whereabouts on the periodic table they are. They're sort of tucked inside of the transition elements, and we saw that when we were working on electron configurations. So these are all of the F block metals, and you'll find in these, that in terms of properties, that we won't see many of them in class. They're either very uncommon to find, they're very rare. Some of them are synthetic, so they're made in labs, and there's never been more than just a little bit of each one. We wouldn't be able to get our hands on them even if we wanted to. Uh, some of them are radioactive, so we wouldn't want to have those around necessarily. And so we just don't see very many of these metals on a, on a regular basis, and certainly not in very many everyday things you would buy, other than those magnets perhaps. Um, and they are also found, some of these are found in uh, certain light bulbs, for example, like for reptile cages, um, because they produce a wide spectrum of light and different wavelengths of energy that the reptile might need to keep itself healthy, uh, to produce vitamins in its skin, that kind of thing, these wide spectrum bulbs. So some of these elements are around in things, but many of them you'll never, in, you'll never encounter in your life, and you could probably be thankful for that, especially with those radioactive ones. Notice here, I have two other terms, the lanthanides and the actinides. The first row, the 4F row, we call the lanthanides because they come after the element lanthanum. And the last row, the 5F row, we call the actinides because they follow the element actinium on the periodic table. So if you see where these elements kind of pop off the periodic table in the D block, you'll find that they follow the elements lanthanum and actinium right here at the beginning of the D block elements, where these, where these uh, inner transition elements kind of sneak in to our periodic table. Well, that's it for the metals. We're going to look at some non-metal groups, and there aren't nearly as many. So let's look rather quickly. The noble gases are group 18. You see them over here in purple. The noble gases, you're going to find out more and more as we go through the next few weeks, are sort of what every other element wishes it could be. The noble gases are like what everybody else looks up to, and that's sort of why they get their name. The noble gases, um, you think about the old days of... of, of uh, of feudalism, I suppose, and, and different classes and societies. The nobles were considered the, you know, t the cream of society, the top. And so everyone else, if they were a poor peasant or something, might wish to be a noble or dream of being a, a prince or a king or, or a, prin a queen or a princess, a noble of some kind or a duke or a duchess or who knows what. And so the nobles are sort of wished, you know, you wish you could be like them. And so the noble, the noble gases are the elements that other elements wish they could be like. Another, perhaps, um, um, I'm not sure if it's more appropriate, but another way to think about noble gases is that these elements don't bond with other elements much. They, stand, they tend to stick with themselves. And so just that same way, back in the day, the nobles would only allow the, you know, their, their children to marry other nobles' children. And so the nobles pretty much stayed in their own little group, stayed to themselves. And these gases do the same thing. These are very stable, these elements. Um, they have what we call an octet of electrons. They're non-reactive, so they don't combine with any other elements uh, spontaneously very often. We can force a couple of them to react on occasion. Don't worry about knowing which ones can do that now. We'll work into that a little bit later and uh, show you some of those, those uh, structures that they make when they do that. Each of the noble gases, again, has eight valence electrons. We call that an octet, just like you might hear in a music group of eight people. Uh, and those eight electrons are the S2 and P6 electrons. There is one exception to that, and that's helium. Helium has just two electrons, a duet, we call it, and that's because helium's configuration is 1s2. If you remember, helium is 1s2, and there is no 1p electrons. There's no 1p6. It just doesn't, there's no such place in the periodic table. And so helium is a noble gas. It's full. Its outer level is as full as it can be. 1s2, you can't add any more electrons to level 1, so that's as full as level 1 gets. And so helium, even though it only has two, valence electrons gets to hang out with and be a noble gas. So the noble gases we'll find out more and more are the sort of the center of the periodic table even though they're way off to the side. Something I'll have you put down is called the octet rule and this part at the top in italics you don't need to write down uh, but I want you to remember if you think back to last unit having an octet of valence electrons was considered extra stable because it means 
that we've got S2 and P6, and those are full sublevels. If you remember, it goes back to that happy and crappy rule that I taught you in class. S2 and P6 are both full, that's happy. So if you put those together, it's extra happy. And so 2 plus 6 makes, makes 8 electrons, and that's what S2P6 would give us in those noble gases. That's why it's considered so stable. And what the octet rule says is that elements that don't have an octet, that aren't a noble gas, in other words, if they don't have an octet of valence electrons, they will combine with each other in order to gain, lose, or share electrons until they've, had, they've got an octet. And so if I don't have 8, I will change in order to get like a noble gas who has 8. And you'll find at the bottom here I say it's especially true for the S and P block elements. So when we're looking at our periodic table and we're finding how these elements are bonding and forming compounds and reacting, it's all kind of based on the idea that everybody wishes they were like a noble gas. Uh, and they try to change some way in their electrons to get like a noble gas. And you'll see more examples of that as we start looking at those Lewis dots more with Lewis structures. The other nonmetals include the halogens. The word halogen comes from a couple of root words, the, the halo and the gen parts, both Greek and uh, Latin roots here. Halogen translates approximately as a salt former. And so these, these are the elements in, in group 17 that form salts. In chemistry, salt is not just what you put on food. Salt is a very generic term that more or less just means you've put a metal with a nonmetal in some way to make this what we call an ionic compound. And that would be considered a salt. Salt, in general, is that stuff we do put on food, but a salt in chemistry is a much broader term. So these halogens can make lots of different salts. Each of these has seven electrons in its valence level, and so that would be those S2 and P5 electrons from last unit for a total of seven. And for the nonmetals, these are the most reactive of all. You'll see here, notice, last of the seven other nonmetals. There's a very kind of generic group here. These are very important elements. Um, most of these are part of, of our build, building blocks for, for uh, body tissues. We've got carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, your DNA. They're largely built on these few elements. Maybe not so much selenium, but lots of the others are involved in almost every molecule in your body. And so pretty important that we, we mention them, even though they don't really have a specific name, and they're kind of scattered across the periodic table. So these last seven elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, and hydrogen are all what we consider the other nonmetals. We kind of have put them together in a little junk drawer here. They're pretty important. The last thing to, to have you mark are called the metalloids. And these are sort of a hybrid between metals and nonmetals. They're really neither one. They're kind of in between. And they have properties of both metals and nonmetals. And so, for example, metal, like metalloid might be lustrous or shiny like a metal, but it might be very brittle like a nonmetal. And in class, I'll show you some samples of elements like silicon and germanium. You can see that they look very brittle uh, and yet shine like a metal. And so those elements you see listed here on the screen, boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium are the six metalloids that I'll classify that way. You might again find occasionally a book that will classify one or even two other elements as metalloids too. Uh, we start getting down here in the very very bottom right corner of the periodic table. Some elements down here like polonium, and astatine, they're kind of borderline. You can call them metalloids if you want, I guess. I won't, I won't necessarily ding you for it. Um, but in the end, we don't work with those elements much in compounds. We don't see them very commonly ever in the lab. And so whether they're metalloids or not, they're not going to be elements that we're going to bump into very often. So I'd mostly just like you to know that metalloids are those elements that are right along the periodic table's stair-step line, that boundary line. And so they're kind of on the fence. Uh, one day I might act like a metal and the next like a non-metal, depending on my situation. That's it. Our next topic will be the, uh, a little history of the periodic table. And I'll tell you a little bit about the people who helped give us the table that we have today. So if you've got all that down, see you in the next video.